I want to welcome our YouTube friends, those, who, those of you who watch us on YouTube, although a lot of you are here now. <laughs> so it, I think it's a whole army of 15. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, you know it, and, uh, but anyways, we're glad you're here. We want to welcome you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our God, and our Savior. While the kids are, are getting ready to go downstairs, I'd like for us to turn in our Bibles to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8. And then the title of my message today is Ram Size Trouble, Goat Quick in Vengeance. How's that for a title? Let me say that again. Ram Size Trouble, Goat Quick in Vengeance. You're probably thinking, oh my goodness, Pastor has flipped his lid. It's like, how did he get that, that, that title? Well, I think as we, as we, as we delve into this chapter, you, you'll understand that quippy little title that uh, I believe the Holy Spirit has given to us. And let's, let's before we, we read the, the scriptures, let's, let us pray and invite the Holy Spirit's presence. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, and we invite you to quicken our minds, quicken our hearts, quicken our obedience. Father God, we don't want to be people that just see the word. We want to be people who do the word. That we don't want to be people in confusion. We want to be people that understand what is going on. And we ask that you would give us this understanding in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're going to be going into a chapter that seems very confusing. It's 27 verses long. And it's got some crazy imagery in it and stuff. But I want you to know something. The Bible is reflexive. And what I mean by that is, whenever you come to a passage of Scripture that seems murky and hard to understand, if you're wise, you'll use Scripture to interpret Scripture, okay? And we're going to attempt to do that without keeping you here for two hours, okay? Because <laughs> this is such a, a, a detailed thing, we could be here a long time, um, but I will do my best to be as uh, succinct and on point as possible. But let's, let's take a look at our good friend Daniel. Um, oh, one, one more thought. Uh, the book of Daniel is very unique in the fact that it was written in two languages. Okay? Um, it does have a smattering of some Greek words and some Persian words, but basically the book of Daniel was written in Hebrew. Surprise, surprise, because it's a Jewish book. But a good portion of it was also written in Aramaic. Hebrew was the language of the Jews. Aramaic was the language of the Babylonians. Okay? And chapters 1 and the first three verses in chapter 2 are in Hebrew. And that makes sense because when you look at the content, it's focusing on the Jewish boys. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Okay? But then in chapter 2, it shifts from Hebrew to Aramaic because the focus that God has is now on the Gentiles instead of the Jews, and that focus stays on the, Jew, on the Gentiles all the way till chapter 7. And then at the end of chapter 7, in the beginning of chapter 8, it stops, the Aramaic stops at 7, and in chapter 8, the Hebrew picks up again. So, so you got to kind of put things in context, 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 okay? You need to put the Bible in the context of the whole. You need to put the passage in the context of the exegesis. And you need to put the, the book itself in the context of history, okay? And the historical context is Daniel is getting, getting along in years, okay? And, it, and the Babylonian Empire is about to come to an end. So let's take a look at what our good friend Daniel has to tell us as he's in the twilight of his career. Okay, In verse 1 it says, In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me. To me, Daniel, after the one that appeared to me the first time. What is Daniel talking about? Well, in Daniel chapter 7, verse 1, it sounds very familiar. Let's, let's, we're going to use scripture to interpret scripture. Let's drop back to Daniel chapter 7, verse 1. Okay. And it says, in the first year of Belshazzar, so two years earlier than the, the vision in Daniel 8 is a vision in Daniel 7. It says, in the first year of Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and the visions of his head while he was on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream telling the main facts. And so basically, in chapter 7, Daniel had a vision. In chapter 8, 
Daniel is having another vision. And that makes sense because God, like Satan, like you, we all have an MO, modus operandus, right? And the, 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 the MO of God, according to our good friend Hosea, is that God uses the prophets, the ministry of the prophets, with similitudes, with prototypes, with examples, to demonstrate his, his plan for mankind. You see, we suffer because we're Westerners. We come from a Greek and Roman based philosophy and the Greek and Roman philosophy, when it comes to prophecy, the, the Roman and Greeks, to them it's prediction fulfillment. And that's okay because it's true. The prophets did predict things and they did come true. In fact, Jesus himself fulfilled over 300 Old Testament prophecies in his first coming. Over 300. Okay, But the Hebrews have a little bit of a different mindset. To them, it's pattern fulfillment. They see the pattern of God. Where we're always looking for the prediction, they see the pattern of God. And that makes sense because in Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, there's a little, little phrase stuck in there. It says, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony or the pattern of of Jesus. And so it's good to think Jewish sometimes when we're looking at these things. Well, let's get our oy vey on, shall we? <laughs> okay. In verse 2, okay, he says, I saw in the vision, and so it happened while I was looking that I was in Sushan, the citadel, which is the province of Elam, and I saw in the vision that I was by the river Uli. Now that, that throws some people off because if you know anything about the Babylonian Empire, the capital of Babylon was not Sushan. That was the capital of the Persian Empire, the empire that follows the Babylonian Empire. And right now Daniel is still working for the Babylonians. Okay, And the capital of the Babylonian Empire was Babylon. Okay, And so Daniel is having a vision. Okay, The Holy Spirit brings him and is showing him prophetically What's going to be the capital of the world next? Okay, Babylon's going to fall. And God's giving clues and hints to Daniel that that's what's happening here. But then in verse 3, it says, he says, Then I lifted my eyes and saw. Guys, we have to lift our eyes Amen. to see. Too many Christians are walking like this. Boom. And walking into walls. We need to lift up our eyes. The book of Colossians says that we are to focus our thoughts on things above where Christ is seated in high places. We need to, when, when, when Abraham was getting ready to plunge the dagger into the heart of Isaac, the Lord himself said, Abram, Abraham and Abraham looked up. We need to look up. God doesn't want us looking down. He wants us looking up. He wants us looking up for his son's return. In the Old Testament, he wanted the, the Jews to be looking up for the appearance of the Mashiach. And that is another MO of God. He's, he, he puts his people in a purposeful and yet active waiting stance. We are called to wait upon the Lord, but while we're waiting upon the Lord, we're called to do his will. Amen. Okay? And this is where some of the rapturites, some of my fellow rapturites get a little messed up because they're so stuck on the rapture that they're not doing anything, okay? And, and you know what? I, I, I'm too hyper to not do something. I need to do something. There, there's a drive within me to do something. And, you know, and the book of James fits that. You know, faith without works is dead. You know, so it's not enough to just be looking up. We need to be waiting in an expectation but we need to be doing. In fact, we need to follow the Thessalonians where it was told that in, in 1 Thessalonians 1, verses 9 and 10, Paul says, it's been reported to us throughout all of Macedonia how you have turned from your idols, you are serving the living God, and you are waiting for the Son from heaven, whom God raised from the dead, even Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath which is to come. If there was a model that I would ask you to live your life, that would be it. Turn from your idols, serve God, and while you're serving God, be looking for his return because he's coming soon. We're one day closer to the rapture, my friends. We're one. I love, yesterday I called my good brother Dave Lambert. Whenever I need a 
pump up. I call Dave because Dave is a rapturite like myself. And, every, and his response is, brother, we're one day closer to the rapture. Amen. And that's awesome. That's awesome. One day closer. But anyways, Daniel looks up and what, what happens? He says, then I lifted my eyes and I saw there standing beside the river was a ram which had two horns and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other and the higher came up last. And I saw the ram pushing westward, northward and southward so that no animal could withstand him, nor was there any that could deliver him from his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. And as I was considering, suddenly a male goat came from the west across the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground and the goat had a notable horn because between his eyes. Then he came to the ram that had two horns, which I, see, which I had seen standing beside the river, and ran at him with furious power. And I saw him confronting the ram, and he was moved with rage against him, and attacked the ram, and broke his two horns. And there was no power in the ram to withstand him, but he cast him to the ground and trampled him, and there was none that could deliver him, the ram from his hand. Therefore the male goat, goat grew very great, but when he became strong, the large horn was broken and in the place of it four notable ones came up toward the four winds of heaven how would you like to have that dream <laughs> what would the Freudians how would they interpret this dream I shudder to think what the Freudians would say but you know something God speaks through dreams and visions in fact Dreams and prophecies and visions will not cease until the Holy of Holies is settled. And what I mean by that, it will, the prophecies and visions of God will not cease until God himself is in control of the Holy of Holies. And what I'm talking about is a Jewish temple, yeah, in Jerusalem, that, yeah, belongs to the Jews, not the Palestinians, it's the Jews, okay, it's their capital. It's going to be their capital. And I advise the world leaders, I'm just going to give you a piece of advice, okay? Let Israel have Jerusalem for their capital. It'll go much easier for you, okay? Much easier for you. President Trump, just saying. Brother, let them have their capital, okay? But God is not done with you he is not done with me. Getting saved is not the end. It's only the beginning. And so they're saying, well, okay, preacher, how does a goat with, or a ram with two horns, very high and one higher than the other, and a, and, a, and a goat with a big horn that turns into four little horns, how does that affect me? How does that affect me as a 21st century, modern day American Christian? Well, you know how it affects you? This is how it affects you. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony. God wants us to know what's going to go on. Now, this particular vision actually is, is going to occur in history. It's already occurred. Okay? And we're going to take a look-see because basically these two animals represent two empires. Okay? Um, the, the, the ram represents the Persian Empire. Check this out. The guardian spirit of the Persian kingdom is in the form of a ram with, with clean feet and sharp, sharp pointed horns. The Persian king at the head of his army wore a head of a ram instead of a crown. So Artaxerxes, Longimanus, and you know, all the Xerxes and Darius and Cyp you know what they wore for their symbol on their head? A ram's head. Okay. And guess what? Guess what, guess what the Greeks did? Check this out. Um, the Greeks, it says here, um, oh, where was it? Okay. The Greeks, their symbol, okay, the goat, a one-horned goat was the symbol of ancient Macedonia, which is where the Greeks started, Macedon. Philip of Macedon himself actually wore a goat's head on his head going into battle. In fact, the Aegean Sea, which is the Greek Sea, means the Sea of Goats or the Goat Sea. 
So but you're saying, well, okay, that's, that's awfully spurious. Someone could come up with other symbology. And you're right, we shouldn't depend upon earthly things. How about scripture? Well, there is an interpretation to this. Drop with me down to verse 19 of the same chapter. In verse 19, this is, now remember, this is Gabriel talking. Gabriel is a messianic messenger. He's talking to Daniel. And in verse 19, he said, he said he, and he said, look, I am making known to you what will happen in the latter time of the indignation, for at the appointed time the end shall be. The ram which you saw having two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia. And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece, and the large horn that is between its eyes is the first king. As for the broken horn and the four horns that rise up in its place, four kingdoms shall arise out of that nation, but not with its power. Let me tell you something about the history of, the, of, the, of, of these two empires. The Persian Empire, as we know it, is actually technically called the Medo-Persian Empire. And when that, that was an alliance between the Medianite, Medians, the Medeites, Medians, whatever, and the Persians. And they did that to overthrow the Babylonians. And, and, and the Medes were the, originally the dominant tribe. And that's the first big horn. But the taller big horn is the Persians. In fact, the Persians come to dominate this empire so much that most people refer to it as the Persian Empire. Okay? And that's a historical fact. You can check that out. The Greek Empire had a different take to it. You notice that, that in the imagery, the Persian Empire, it moved to the, to the west, to the north, and to the south. The Persian Empire came from what we would call Syria, okay? That, that land bridge between Europe and Asia and Africa, okay? And so if they're going to conquer, they really couldn't go eastward because was, that was a sea right there. They would go northward, they would go westward, and they would go south, okay? See, the Bible is accurate, even geographically accurate. And so if you remember from our last time in the book of Daniel, remember when we were chapter 7, I, was that last week? I think it was last week. The Persian Empire had a different symbol to it. It had a symbol of a bear with three ribs in its mouth. And scholars believe that those three ribs represents the three directions that the Persian Empire conquered her enemies. And also represents three major battles with the Babylonians, the Lydians, and the Egyptians. And that would be north, west, and south. Interesting. The second one is the goat. The goat with the big horn. Okay, And the big horn is Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great is, is, a, is a key figure in history. He was a, a phenom. Okay? He, Alexander, his father, Philip of Macedon, was a rough, tumble football guy. You know, very physical, muscular. And, and he, was the first, you know, he was king of the Macedonians. Okay? And, he, and he had a son by the name of Alexander who was more of a bookworm. And a disappointment to his rough and tough tumble father, okay? But, 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 but uh, Alexander had one of the greatest tactical minds train him, Aristotle. Okay, Aristotle's science was pretty bad. If you study Aristotle, Aristotle science, he was messed up when it came to science. But when it came to mili military tactics, he was a genius. And he trained young Alexander. And at a very young age, Philip of Macedon died. And Alexander took possession of the throne of the Macedonians at the tender old age of 19. Wow. 19 years old. And within 11 years, this 19-year-old conquered the entire known world from, from all the way from the west of Greece, all the way down to the south of Egypt, all the way to the east of India. Huge empire in 11 years. And you notice in this vision, what did this goat do? This goat was fast, right? We just read that it was so fast that its feet didn't even touch the ground. And it had a big horn, and, and Alexander was this big horn. And, and through a life of debauchery and riotous living, he died at a very young age. He was like 32, 33 when he died. And as he was dying, his generals came to him and said, to whom shall we give the kingdom? And you know what Alexander said? He said, give it to the strong. Oh, that's a nice way to pass down power. You know what that led to? That led to civil war. And there were four key generals that fought for 22 years over Alexander's kingdom. Cassander, Lysimachus, Seleucus, and Ptolemy. These four generals fought for the kingdom of, of Alexander because it was so huge. And after a while, they said, hey, this is, this is pointless. Why don't we just divide it up into four 
kingdoms. And they did. And the two kingdoms that, as biblical people, we would be interested in would be Seleucus' kingdom and Ptolemy's kingdom. And you say, why? Because Seleucus, they basically took the Middle East. They took that land bridge where Syria and Iraq and Iran existed and, and the northern parts of and Israel and, and the little bits of northern parts of, of, uh, of, of Africa. And the Ptolemies, they took basically what was Egypt. Okay? And these two warring factions, the Ptolemies and the Seleucids, fought with each other. And guess what little country in the middle they trampled on as they fought with each other? Israel. What is happening today in the Middle East? you got the world powers fighting over little Israel. Little Israel is caught in the middle and you got these countries that want to trample her every time they can. You know what? History, man fails to learn from history. We keep making the same mistakes over and over and over again because you know what? A lot of us think history is boring. Oh, history is boring. I can't stand history. It's boring. I don't want to learn about What do I need to learn about dates and these guys? Because you know what? There are some really brilliant people in the past. Some very godly people. In fact, I would tell you that history is his story. Okay, But anyways, these four generals fought with each other, and it was the Ptolemies and the Seleucids that, and, that are fought. And Daniel, before it happened, predicted what was these battles in J chapter 11. We're not there yet. Okay, we'll get there and stuff. But, but these battles were predicted. And I know this seems awfully tedious. You say, well, Pastor, what are you getting at? That's history. That's behind us. Don't we look forward to the future? You're always talking about the rapture and the blessed hope. And, you know, shouldn't we be looking forward? We need to look back so we can look forward many times. God, with the Jews, he had seven major feasts. And in those feasts, they looked back to what God did for them so that they could look forward to what he was going to do for them. That's an MO of God. We need to remember our blessings so that we don't impugn God when things get rough. When God starts giving us a test, what happens when God gives us tests? He gets quiet, right? Have you been there? You know, you're going through a hard time. You know, your finances are struggling. You're having trouble with your children. Your marriage is in trouble. Your car's breaking down. You're, you're, you're trying to do this. You're trying to do that. And you're praying to God, where are you, God? And silence. <laughs> right? That's right. Yeah. You know why? Because the teacher doesn't talk to the student while the student is taking the test. The teacher talks to the student after the test is over with. <laughs> and to throw in another little euphemism, without the test, there's no testimony. If we, you know, if, if, if we got what we always prayed for, just this smooth life where nothing ever went wrong, we wouldn't have a testimony. Amen. <laughs> There's something to be said about value coming from something that's fought for. You know, the Bible says the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take possession of it. There are some people who get saved and they just coast. They're just content. I got my fire insurance. I, I checked in that church once a week. You know, I did my Christian duty. I'm, I'm good. Now I can just skate along, you know, into, into glory land with Jesus. And you know what? You will. If you're, if you're born again and you're skating, you're, you're going to get raptured too. You're not going to get left behind. Okay. But the question is, how, when you stand before the beam of seat of Christ, what will you tell Jesus? Well, I was too busy doing my own thing, Lord. I, you know, I know your stuff was important, but gosh, you know, I'm only human. You know what? God has called us to do great things. Amen. They don't have to be big things. You know what I think is one of the greatest things? Is loving a child with the love of God. Teaching them to walk in the ways of the Most High God. Showing them you know, and being real with them. You know, I was real with my son. My son saw me sin. Oh, pastor sins. Yeah, don't tell anybody. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to lose my job. Yeah, we all sin. But I was always real with my, my son. I always told him, you know what? Daddy sins. That's why daddy needs Jesus, just like everyone else. Amen. And when our children see the reality of our faith, it emboldens them. Anyways, so these are two empires. And that was the first point. The empires. The animal empires. You can call them that. And now you understand why ram-sized trouble, goat-quicken vengeance. Okay. All right. 
But God wants us to understand. What is the understanding of this passage? Because you, you're like, okay, preacher, you dug that out and you, you have the tools to do that. I can't do that. I don't have those kind of things. And, you know, you know how, do you, how do you understand? You understand by God. Okay, because that's how Daniel did it. Let's go to verse 15. Let's, let's read verses 15 through 19. It says, Then it happened when I, Daniel, had seen the vision and was seeking the meaning. We need to seek first the kingdom of God. Amen. The reason why a lot of Christians don't understand the word of God, the, the reason why a lot of Christians are doing their own thing instead of building the kingdom of God is because we're not seeking first the kingdom of God, which comes with a promise, by the way. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. You know what are some of those happy times for me? Is when I was on fire for Jesus, seeking his kingdom first, no hold bar, young buck, thought I could do anything that God called me to do, had the audacity to think that I would lead millions of people into the kingdom of God, celebrating Jesus Christ full on. And you know where, where, where a lot of that came from? I'll never forget when I was in my 20s, my brother, Chris, and my, and my friends, um, uh, my cousin, Mike Miller, we would go to these Christian concerts. Okay, and our favorite group was Striper, and we would be at this concert, and this this, this Striper, they are a Christian heavy metal. They are worship at full volume, you know. And a lot of people don't like that stuff. I get that. We all have different musical tastes. One man's music is another man's noise, but to us, this was music. And we're there, we're worshiping Jesus, we're raising our hands, we're declaring Jesus King of Kings and Lord of Lords because that's what they're singing. By the way, they're singing about how God came into their life, how God take, took them from being losers to being winners how that he is the king of kings and the lord of lords. They even did the battle hymn of the republic. That's how they would open up their concerts. They would open up their concert with smoke and they'd start playing the battle hymn of the republic and the Holy Spirit heebie-jeebies would come on my skin and, 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 and they would come on and the crowd would get whipped up and we have the anti-Satan sign on one side and a pro-God sign on the other and fireworks and we'd be worshiping Jesus full on. Excited pumped up, ready to go and tell people about Jesus. And my cousin Mike and I did that. We were, we were insulation mechanics. And we witnessed to people all the time at the work sites. Because we were stoked. Because we were listening to a band that was telling us that Jesus is the answer. They even sing a song, He is the reason for the season. It's a Christmas song. Yes. But then, but there's a lyric that says he's the reason for any season. Because he's the creator of all seasons. Amen. And yeah, they looked weird. And yeah, a lot, of, a lot of Christians misunderstood them. Some didn't like it, you know. But I'm, I'm telling you, I remember those days. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, here I am with my brother and my cousin and my best friends. And we're worshiping Jesus. And we're having a great time. We're singing and dancing and raising our hands and, and just being, being Jesus lovers. And we don't have to worry about lying to our parents. We don't have to pop breath mints in our mouth because we're not drinking beer or taking drugs. We don't have to worry about any of that stuff. We're coming home because we're stoked up for Jesus. And I, and I thought to myself, it does, life doesn't get any better than this. Amen. And it's true. And you know what? You know what that group inspired me to do? Like I said, to witness to people. And I'll share this example, this, this other example. I, like I said, I was an insulation mechanic and, and my boss has sent me to this one job site. And my job was to measure the pipe and say how much feet we need and how many fittings we need and all that stuff for the insulation. We're some of the last, one of the last trades to come on a site because we're covering the pipes. And I'm looking at the stuff and, and this guy comes up to me and goes, so, how do you think the world's going to end? Big smile came on my face. I'm like, oh, that is a meatball right down the center plate, baby. I'm going to crank that thing right out of the park. And I started witnessing to him. And I started telling him how I worshipped and loved Jesus. And how Jesus was coming back. And how the church was going to get raptured. And if you didn't if you weren't part of the rapture, you'd get left behind and you'd have to deal with the Antichrist. But even then, you could still get saved. You could be part of that, the great harvest of the 144,000 Jewish pilgrims. And I told him everything. I let it rip. I let it loose. And it was fun. Amen. And, and, and God was pleased because the spirit of prophecy is 
the testimony of Jesus. And I believe that Daniel was operating in that same sphere. God showed Daniel the future of the Persian Empire and the Greek Empire and the Roman Empire. But the, in this chapter, it's just the Greek and the Persian Empires. Okay, and we're going to get to that. We're going to get to the, you know, and, and, and Gabriel says, I've come to make you understand. God wants us to understand these things. These are not things to be avoided. These are things that we are called to understand. And I have scripture to back that up. Turn in your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18, uh, Abraham, who is the only person in the Old Testament that was called the friend of God, Okay, and you can look that up. It actually says Abraham, the friend of God. You get, go on Google, go, you know, go to your, the Blue Bible, and you can, you can find the, the passage, the, the verse that says that Abraham was the friend of God. And it's proven in this text because, because Abraham enters, ends up interceding for Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and remember, Abraham, he's at his tent, Sarah's at the tent, and they see three guys coming towards his home. And he tells Sarah, oh, three guys are coming. Let's make a meal for each of them. Okay, and he makes the meal. They sit down, they eat the meal. And, and what it is, it's the Lord and two angels. And the Lord stays with Abraham and sends the two angels to Sodom and Gomorrah. You know what happened there. Okay, we don't need to go into that. But this is what the, the Lord says to the two angels before he sends them. He says, Then the men rose from there and looked towards Sodom. And Abraham went with them to, to send them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? There's something about being the friend of God. God will show you the future. That's why horoscopes and crystal balls and all that stuff is, is garbage because that is demonic. Because that's Satan trying to take the place of God and giving you the future. Satan can't give you anything. Okay? And he's not in control of the future. God is. Okay? You say, okay, well that's Old Testament. All right. You push my buttons, let's go to the Gospel of John. Okay? Yeah, I have these, these imaginary friends that... John chapter 15, verse 15. John 15, 15. Easy verse to remember. Notice what... This is, in, this is on the night in which Jesus was betrayed. This is what he said to, to the disciples. He says, in verse 15 of John 15, No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends... For all things that I heard from my Father, I have made known unto you. And then go drop down um, to verse 26. But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me, and you will also bear witness, because I have been, you have been with me from the beginning. And, uh, and, and later on in chapter 16, Jesus says, The Holy Spirit will show you things yet to come. Actually, let's not take my word for it. Let's go John 16. John chapter 16. Um, thank you. John 16, 13. Thank you, bud. It says, However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. How do we learn God's will? We seek Him. We seek the kingdom of God and we listen to what the Holy Spirit says. Because in Revelation, the first, uh, in chapters 2 and 3, seven times God says, let him who has ears hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The problem with the Church of America is we're not listening. God is talking, but we're not listening. God is working, but we aren't. We are building our own kingdom and, 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 and neglecting his kingdom. And I'm not saying that we aren't supposed to work. We are supposed to work. We're supposed to support our families. And I'm not saying that we can't build houses. And I'm not saying that we can't own boats. And I'm not saying we can't buy cars. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is if those things are more important to you than the kingdom of God, then something's wrong. You will have all those things too. You know? But the world doesn't get it. Remember the parable of the rich man with the barns? He was going to build bigger barns. And the Lord says, you fool. This night your, your soul is required of you. And what will it profit a man if he gains the world but yet loses his soul? That's why that, that, that meeting was so important to me. Not because I wanted to take care of the green issue. Those two men's souls are in jeopardy. 
We need to pray for Tom and Don that they get born. I don't think that they were brought in by accident. They were brought in by the Spirit of God. And we need to, I'm tired of playing games. It's time to be bold. It's time to step out. It's time to walk on the water. Get out of the boat. The boat's comfortable. The, the water's not. It's scary, but it, it's time. And Daniel, he, you know, he's seeking God. That's how you, do, you say, how do I do that, Pastor? Seek God. Seek God. When you don't know what to do, seek God. When you don't know what to do, get into the heart of worship. Find whatever music. For me, it's Striper. I've been playing Striper all week. Can you tend, tell? I'm like, it's like I'm on, on, on caffeine. Okay, I'm, I'm great. Okay, because why? Because when I listen to that particular group, they bring me into the heart of worship. Amen. Not praise. Praise is the fruit of the lips. Worship is spirit to spirit, heart to heart. It's where the excitement and the power of God comes down upon you. It's where you will see things as God sees things. And you will do things that God tells you to do. In fact, Jesus said, greater things you will do. And I've appointed you that you should bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. You know, and I, and I, I think one of the best examples is Billy Graham. I, I think of Bill, Billy Graham did do great, some greater things than even Jesus. <laughs> Jesus in his earthly ministry. Now, okay, don't get all technical with me. I know Jesus is the one that saves everybody. Okay, I get that. That's, that's not what I'm talking about. But what I'm talking about when Jesus was on the earth, he led about 500 people into the kingdom. It has been estimated that Billy Graham has led between 200 and 220 million, I said million, people into the kingdom of God. Amen. And it looks like his son is walking the same path because good old Franklin, by visiting every single state capital in the Union, led 8,000 people into the kingdom of God. Now, I know it's Jesus through Franklin Graham. I get that. But Franklin Graham had to seek first the kingdom of God to do that. Could God save the world without us? Absolutely. He doesn't need us. But he's told us, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Okay? And so, and, and you, know what I, you know what? Also, God blessed me in my devotionals. In my devotions, um, the, the devotional leader, he had done some research about war during the 20th century. And one of the horrible things about the 20th century is that it's been estimated about 180 million people died in wars in just in the 20th century alone. And then it dawned on me. God used Billy Graham to lead more people into the kingdom than Satan killed in all the wars of the 20th century. Amen. Isn't that kind of cool? Yes. Isn't that kind of neat? He beat him by 40 million. That's awesome. God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. <laughs> oh, man. Amen. So we, we see the two animal empires, and God wants us to have an understanding. Oh, l l there's some more verses about understanding. Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. My favorite rapture passage, the first verse, says it all. It really does. I'm talking about God wants us to understand these things. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. Okay? 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13. It says, if I could just get there. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13. It says, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren. Concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. And falling asleep is just a nice way of saying they died. Okay? God doesn't want you ignorant about the dead in Christ. He wants you to know where they're to go. And I was listening to a great sermon by Dr. David Jeremiah, where he specifically addressed where people go when they die. Okay? And uh, more to come. I'm not going to get into that, but I just want you to, my point is, God wants us to understand these things. And then one more, one more, one more verse. Matthew, you know, you say, well, that's, that's good for the church. Well, what about the Jewish people during the tribulation? Yeah, God wants them to understand his plan too. If you go with me to Matthew 24, verse 15, 
This is what God says to the Jewish world after the rapture. Okay? Well, actually, he said it before the rapture, but it applies to a time after the rapture when Israel replaces the church. So I do believe in replacement theology. I just believe that Israel replaces the church, not the church replaces Israel. Okay? That's, there's a big difference there. Okay? But Matthew 24, verse 15, he says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, Whoever reads, let him understand. Amen. God doesn't want you ignorant. God wants you to understand. And, 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 and he wants you seeking him. Seeking his... And one last one, Daniel, even Daniel himself. Go with me to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel 9. Um, the interrupted prayer. Verse 20 says, Now while I was speaking, this is Daniel talking, and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And he informed me and talked to me and said, O oh, Daniel, I have come now forth to give you skill to understand. Where does it say that we're supposed to throw up our hands and say, oh, these prophecies are too wonderful for us to understand. Oh, we don't, we'll never really understand them. Oh, well, we'll find out in glory land. No! God wants us not to be ignorant. He wants us to understand, and he wants us seeking his will. Back to Daniel 7, I mean Daniel 8. There is an evil one coming, and that's the third point. We have the animal empires, godly understanding, and then the evil one. And the evil one is spoken of uh, first in verse 9. It says, and, and one of them, out of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great towards the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. Remember, the, this is about the goat. Remember how the goat had one horn, and the horn broke into four pieces? Well, amongst those four horns came another little horn. Does that sound familiar? Didn't we have a little horn in the previous chapter? Yeah. And that little horn can't, grew up for, in between the ten horns of the fourth beast. Who's the fourth beast? The fourth beast was Rome. Right? It had the iron, the iron teeth. Okay? Iron was the, the Roman Empire. Remember? And See, there, there's three visions that we're working from. In Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar had the image of the, 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 the idol, the head of gold, the arms and chest of silver, the belly of brass, and the legs of iron, and the feet partly iron, partly clay. And, and wh who was the head of gold? The Babylonian Empire. Who conquered the Babylonians? The Persians. So the silver was the Persians. Who conquered the Persians? The Greeks. So the, so the Greeks of the Bronze Empire. Who conquered the Greeks? The Romans. Who conquered the Romans? Nobody. The Roman Empire lasted all the way to the, to the um, 15th and 16th century, and then it just fell apart. And pieces of the Roman Empire have been dominating the planet ever since. And there are some who believe that this end-time Roman Empire is going to have a Muslim element to it. Well, look at who's invading Europe. Who's, who's invading all these pieces of broken pieces of the Roman Empire? It's all coming together in spades, my friends. All coming together. God wants us to understand the times and the seasons in which we live in. And we need to know what the past is about so that we can understand the future. Because if you don't know that God will deliver you from past deliverances, how can you have faith that he will deliver you in the future? How can you have faith about that? We should not fear the future. We have the blessed hope. In fact, we're called, Titus 2.13, to look for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing, the second coming, the rapture and the second coming. It shouldn't scare us Christians because we're not appointed to suffer wrath Amen. but to receive salvation through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ so that whether we're awake or asleep we may live with him forever Isn't that, cool? first, that was 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 9 through 11 just came out you know See, but, but you've got to get it in for it to come out anyway getting back verse 9 is talking about Antiochus Epiphanes how would you like to have a name? Antiochus Epiphanes. Sounds pretty impressive, doesn't it? You know what Epiphanes means? It means God made manifest. Antiochus Epiphanes was a king of the Seleucid Empire. He was the eighth king. of the Seleucid, And he had the gall to call himself God. Okay? And you know what this 
man God did? He persecuted the Jews. He made it illegal for them to practice Judaism. If, if you circumcised your sons, you died. If you offered up sacrifices, you died. If the priests went into the Holy of Holies to worship God and intercede, they died. In fact, he got so bad that he put pig sacrifices on the altar of sacrifices, and he put a, 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 an image of Zeus in the Holy of Holies, and he committed what was called the abomination of desolation. And it's only happened once in human history. And Antiochus Epiphanes is the dude who did it. Okay? And so, because of that, scholars call him the little Antichrist of the Old Testament. But he's a foreshadow of someone else. Because Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he says, We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that you let not your mind so soon be shaken, nor troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as if from us, that the day of the Lord is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there be thee falling away, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or God that is worshipped, and, and declares himself to be God in the Holy of Holies. Antiochus Epiphanes was acting out what the Antichrist is going to do for real. See, Antiochus Epiphanes was just a man who put an idol in the Holy of Holies. The Antichrist is going to be a dem demonically empowered superman who actually goes in, in, into the Holy of Holies, the Jewish temple, and says, I'm God. You can't worship anyone but me. In fact, Daniel tells us that this man in chapter 9 is going to make a treaty with Israel for seven years. And the treaty is this. Israel is going to be able to offer up their sacrifices, their morning and evening sacrifices in the temple for seven years. But in the middle of those seven years, he breaks the treaty. Why? Because he goes into the temple and says, I'm God. You can only worship me now. And the book of Revelation says that he comes in with peace at first, but then he turns on the Jews and he begins to destroy them. In fact, he is going to wipe out two-thirds of the Jewish population in seven years. He's going to double up what Hitler did. Hitler destroyed one-third of the Jewish population with the concentration camps. This guy is going to double up on Hitler. He's going to make Hitler look like a Boy Scout. And he's coming. You say, why is that important to me? Because if you're not born again, guess what? He's your future. You're going to have to deal with him. If you're not born again of God's spirit, you're going to get left behind. And if you're left behind, that means you're going to have to put up with the Antichrist. You're going to have to figure it out. You're going to have to know that he is the evil one. Okay? And you're going to have to do it without the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit started on the day of Pentecost. Okay? In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit wasn't poured out on all flesh. He, he wasn't poured out on all flesh until the New Testament. He's been up, and the Holy Spirit right now is out on all flesh. And so if, you're, if you've got your, the Word of God and, and you've got half a brain, you can figure out what evil is today. It's very easy. But when the Antichrist comes, the deception is going to be so thick that you're going to have a hard time seeing through it. You know why? Because if you accustom your heart to enjoying evil over and over again, pretty soon you buy what evil says. And evil says good is bad and bad is good. If you don't believe me, look at our culture. The things that we're being told that are good today, 40 years ago would have been, that is awful. That is vile. That is just, that is just, you, you, you're insane. But now it's acceptable. 1973, up until 1973, homosexuality was concern, considered a mental illness. Now, by me saying that, people who are gay will say, that's hate speech. I don't hate gay people, I really don't. Because you know why? Because God loves them. Amen. God loves the gay community, he does. He doesn't want the gay community living in gay, in gay lifestyles, because it's a lifestyle of death. God doesn't want them to die, he wants them to live. But you tell that to a gay person face to face, get ready to get smacked. Okay? Canada, you can't even legally say that anymore. They'll throw, they'll throw you in prison and re-educate re you.
And, you, and, and, and thank God, uh, God has given America a reprieve. I really believe that. I really believe that. I think, I think the president we have in there is God's man. Whether, whether you like him or not, whether you think he's a jerk, whether you think he's unpresidential, doesn't matter. I really, there are prophecies that say that he is God's man for this hour. And these prophecies are right on specifically true. And, it, and it, you know, if you don't believe me, I have the website. I can bring you right to the website and I can show you how prophecy is being fulfilled by these prophets. There are two men who prophesied about him being president before he even considered running. One did it in 2007, the other one did it in 2011. Come on, preacher, you don't believe that, do you? Yeah, I do. I absolutely do. But what, anyways, the evil one, and, and it's, we're, we're losing time here, and like I said, I could go on and on and on and on about, there's so much detail here, you know, and that's why we do Bible studies on the book of Daniel, because really it's a Bible study where you get all, you get all the details, because we can, we can spend two, three, four weeks on it if we need to. But, but let's, let's look what happens to the, the, the real Antichrist, because the real Antichrist, it shows up in verse 10, it says, And it grew up to the host of heaven, and it came, and it cast down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. Even he exalted himself as high as the prince of the host and by him daily sacrifices were taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast down because of the transgression an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifice and he cast truth down to the ground he did all this and prospered and that's what the antichrist is going to do he's going to prosper by doing all this evil but what's going to happen to him well the interpretation is later on in the chapter go with me to verse 23 it says and in the latter time of their kingdom when transgressors have reached the fullness a king shall arise having a fierce countenance, who understands sinister schemes. His power will be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy fearfully, and shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty, and also the holy people. Through his cunning, he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule. He shall exalt himself in his heart. He shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without human means." And the vision of the evenings and mornings, which was told of it, is true. Therefore, seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. This Antichrist character is going to dominate the world. He is going to do evil things. It says he's going to destroy people through peace. Okay? It's, he's going to, he's going to, and he's, and, and he's going to get away with it. And the people, the believers that are on the earth at the time, the ones who weren't smart enough to get saved before the rapture, but were smart enough to get saved after the rapture, they're going to grieve in their spirits. Like, how long, O oh Lord, is this evil one going to prosper? How long is he going to get away with this stuff? What's going to happen? And if they're studying the Word of God, they'll realize, oh, okay, it's seven years he's going to do this. Or actually, technically, three and a half. Okay? And they'll have some hope. They'll say, okay, when did he come to power? When was he made the treaty? All right, we can count down and we'll know the very day when God's coming back to destroy him. But the rest of the world, they're not going to know that. And that's why Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, uh, chapter 5, verse 3 says this. He says, and they, the world, shall cry peace and safety. And then sudden destruction shall come upon them as travail upon a woman with a child. And they shall not escape. That's the bad news. See, this guy's going to come in and say, world peace. And you know what? We need to deal with a sectarian group of people who think that their religion is the only religion that can save people. That doesn't work for world peace. Does that sound familiar to you? Yeah. It's, it's happening already, my friends. The spirit of Antichrist is already working. It's just that the spirit of God is holding it back. Okay, my previous church, we had missionaries to, 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 to France, and they wanted to build a church in France, and the French government wouldn't let them. And you know what they, the reason they gave these people? They said, we don't allow Christians to build churches because Christianity is against the one world religion, and that's what we're for, the one world religion. There are two spirits in the world, the spirit of Antichrist and the spirit of God. There is the devil's team and there's God's team. There's the wicked and there's the righteous. There's the heathen and there's the saved. We're, mankind, we are not the family of men. We're not all one big family. The family has been split in two. Part of the family is damned and on their way to hell. The other part of the family is saved and on their way to heaven. And that's the truth of it.
And people, and especially in America, we don't want to hear this stuff. We don't want to hear there's only one way to salvation. We want to have multiple ways to God because we're Americans and nobody's the boss of us and we'll do what we want. And we'll do what we think is right. And the Bible says there's a way that seems right unto a man that leads to death. And you know what? Look at Israel's history. In the times of the judges, you know how Israel lived? Every man did what was right in his own sight. And you know what, their, you know what their, the result was? They got conquered time and time again. And they suffered. And then they cried out. And, they, and then they would, they, they would do what was right. And then they would, they, then they would suffer. And they would cry out. They had this endless cycle of, of being wicked and then being punished and then crying to God and then being wicked. and being Instead of just walking with God in the first place. Amen. Yes. This, my friends, if you're in Christ, this is not your future. But if you're not in Christ, if you are not born again, this is your future. Because let me tell you something. Most of mankind is going to be killed in that seven-year period. 75% of the Gentile world, gone. How do I know that? Book of Revelation. 66% of the Jewish world, gone. How I know that? Book of Zechariah. Okay? Think about that. Think it. So basically, probably around 70% of the entire world will be killed. And I close with this verse. Verses. Isaiah chapter 26, verses 19 through 21. Pay attention. Thy dead men shall live. Together with my dead body they shall arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust, for thy dew is as the dew of the herbs in the morning. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, and hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth shall no more cover her slain, and the blood of the dead will be revealed. Think about that. What would happen if 70% of the world's population died in seven years? I think there'd be a lot of bodies unburied and a lot of blood-soaked fields. You go to Gettysburg, and there were tens of thousands of men that died in that battle. And they said at the end of that battle, the field was literally soaked in blood. That's just tens of thousands. How about, see, what, what, what is the population of the world? Six, seven billion? Seventy percent of that? You're talking about four to five billion people dying in seven years? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Amongst other things that are dying too. How do I know this? I seek first the kingdom of God and I study his word. And I meditate on it. And I restudy it. You know, a lot of us think, oh yeah, yeah I, I, I went through a Bible study in Revelation. I got that down. I'm good. <laughs> really? You got it down, you're good? Okay? You, you don't need to learn nothing more? Every time I look at the book of Revelation, I learn something new. Man, I, 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 want, I want to follow you. If that's you, you must be the smartest human being in the universe. Okay? If you got it all down, teach me. <laughs> how to get it all down none of us have it all down you know Jesus said that he came to fulfill this word not to abolish it but to fulfill it and he said heaven and earth shall pass away but my words shall not pass away and oh and by the way he's given us some helps the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but spiritual to the pulling down of strongholds and taking captive vain imaginations and evil thoughts and bringing them under the lordship and deity of Jesus Christ you have trouble in your life it's because you're not using your weapons. You need to use your weapons. You need to be like a killer flea with a sledgehammer. You dare not stop. Yeah. Yeah. Killer flea with a sledgehammer. Let's pray. I've gone on. Father, Lord, I, I pray in Jesus' name, Father, that you would help us to be like Daniel. Daniel constantly sought you. He sought your kingdom. He sought to, to follow you. And Lord, this, this chapter can seem very confusing. It seems, can even seem maybe boring to some. But Lord, it really is a, a gateway to the future as to what's going on. Lord, we, we see that there are two horns. There's the little horn of, of, of Daniel chapter 7 and the little horn of Daniel chapter 8. And there are two people. 
And Revelation 13 gives us the answer to those two people. It's the, it's, the, it's the Antichrist and the false prophet. It's the beast and the false prophet. And Lord, your word just gives us all this detail. And, and Lord, sometimes I think we just take you for granted. We take your word for granted because we live in a free country. Lord, I ask that you would set this church on fire, set this pastor on fire, set this board of elders on fire, set these congregants on fire so that we would repent of our sins, that we would cry out to you, and that you would heal our land, and that we would walk in unity. Lord, forgive us for backbiting and, and saying uh, things that are not nice about each other, pointing out faults and fallacies and sins. Lord God, when we're all filled with fallacies and sins, Lord, help us. Lord, I know that you have great things for us. And Lord, you're not a God that's harsh. You're a God that's merciful. Your mercy is new every morning. Lord, we can, we can no matter what mistake we make today, we can, we can bring it to you. And you said that you would forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, help us to do that. Lord, you, I believe that you, you said in your word that you have a future and a hope for us. For every single person here, a future and a hope. Lord God, help us to find that future and hope by seeking first your kingdom. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you're a listener who doesn't know Jesus Christ, if you're, if you're not born again of God's Spirit, today's the day of salvation. Jesus could come back right now, and if he were to come back right now, and if you're not saved, you're going to get left behind, and you're going to have to meet the most horrible person this world has ever seen, the Antichrist. We at First Congregational Church don't want that to happen to you. And so we ask you, come to Jesus, accept him into your heart. And if you would just pray this real simple prayer with me, you can punch your ticket for the rapture on Airline Jesus. So just pray with me. Dear Jesus, I believe that I am a sinner. I believe that you are the Son of God. I ask you to forgive me for my sins, to cleanse me from my iniquities. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my God. Be my Savior. I surrender to you. I ask that you would do this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you did that for the first time, happy birthday. Today truly was your day of salvation. One, one last favor I ask of you. If you could just go and tell a Bible preaching pastor or friend, someone you trust, what you did. Tell them how you accepted Christ into your heart. Because there's something about speaking out what we do that builds up our faith in Jesus. Well, from, from the rest of us at First Congregational Church, we'll see you next week, and may God bless you all the days of your life.